Thank you. Thank you, technical people, for finding that. That's great. And thank you, Anne. Can you hear me okay? All righty. And I just want to thank Tom Hildage as well. I got to know him over the last few months at the Endangered Species Panel, and I want to thank him for inviting me, even though he can't be here today. So I work for CPAW's Wildlands League. We're a charity. We're a conservation group. And uh, that's just a little bit about who we are. Um, we're the big landscape people. We've been talking a lot about Southern Ontario, Central Ontario. We're going to Northern Ontario in this presentation. That's where the big landscapes are, public lands, and that's the, land, the, the, the lands and the waters that we work on. So today I'd like to talk about some successes. See what you mean about that being loud. Um, I'd like to talk about some successes today. I know we like to raise the alarm, but uh, you know, Tom said, uh, share some innovation, and I've got two, pe two examples to share with you today, hopefully, and uh, some food for thought on the Ring of Fire. So the uh, first example I want to talk about is hydro, a hydro line in northern Ontario. It was to uh, expand transmission in northwestern Ontario. It was proposed in 2008-2009, uh, I believe. And it was located, uh, it was going to connect the bottom of Lake Nipigon and go all the way up across uh, Wabakimi and go to Pickle Lake. It was going to be quite long. And it was quite a damaging route that was chosen for um, if, you, if you were worried about wide-ranging species uh, such as caribou, and that was one of the species that we were very concerned about that uh, we pay attention to. And so I don't think you could have chosen a worse route um, for the species. And this route um, caused a lot of consternation among scientists, environmental groups, and some concerned Canadians. But we... Uh, and part of the reason why it was, such a, it was going to be a, a challenge for us is that it represented a permanent linear disturbance in caribou habitat. It was going to sever Wabakimi from uh, the far north. And, um, and the reason why, you probably wonder why do they care so much about caribou. You hear about it in the media. You hear about it, you know, caribou, caribou, caribou. Why do we care about caribou? Well, it's because it's an indicator species, and it means that you have, if you've got good caribou populations, healthy caribou populations, you've got a healthy boreal forest. So we often rely on caribou as an indicator. So it is a threatened species in Ontario and Canada. Uh, they do live in remote parts of the forest. They live far away from disturbances, and sometimes they're not found uh, you know, as far as 10, 15 kilometers from the nearest cutover or road. But it was not all dark, it was not all gloom. We were really happy to be in a situation where there were alternatives and there were other solutions possible. And we suggested that you avoid and minimize, um, you know, opening up these new uh, intact areas by aligning the transmission line along roads and existing railways. So we said, so we, we were beginning, we, were, we weren't just there to say no, we were there to say no to one, but yes to another. And so alternatives were available, and these were the alternatives that we put forward. And funny enough, and this doesn't work in all cases, but in this case, the alternatives were cheaper to build. So we had two good reasons why um, they should look at uh, alternatives. So on that, on that slide, you can see the red route. That would be the route originally proposed. And then we took a look at it and said, OK, we can think of at least two more. And the, we color coded them, uh, green, yellow, and red. And the green one would be our, our first solution to you, our first option. If you're, if you're trying to get energy to pick a lake, you could twin the existing road and get there, and it's cheaper to build. If that's not your, uh, if that doesn't fit your fancy, the second option we, would be, we, would, we suggested was, all right, well, how about we go up the west side of Lake Nipigon, cut across the bottom of Wabakimi, because there's already a railway going through the bottom of Wabakimi, so I'm already suggesting that you piggyback on existing infrastructure, even though it goes through a park, and then you, go, you hit the road and go, you go up to the road. And as a... 
A last option would be the one that Hydro One put forward. So we thought we were being reasonable. Um, we thought that uh, you know that that would make some it would make sense. It would be a good idea. Some of the folks in Hydro One didn't think so. So we were uh, put into the position of having to uh, generate some letters, talk to some folks. Canadians had to get involved. Um, and, for, and, and keep in mind, this was not something that we thought we were going to have to deal with. We, were, um, we had a whole slew of projects already lined up for the year, and then bam, we had this Hydro One project, and it was like, oh my god, we have to deal with this off the corner of our desk. So 4,000 Canadians weighed in. We had postcards, emails. Um, we spoke to people within government. And in November 2010, the Ministry of Energy announced that Lo and behold, to us, it was a complete surprise because we often don't expect that things are going to go positively when we raise issues. But in November of 2010, the Minister of Energy announced that a new transmission line would be to Pickle Lake would be one of the five priorities and that it was going to be routed from Ignace to Pickle. And so we were like, hmm, that's wonderful. What a great idea. And it's cheaper to build. And so we weren't afraid to say that. So we congratulated the Minister of Energy. And um, I don't want you to think that we were the only ones involved. There were scientists that weighed in from Wildlife Conservation Society Canada. There were independent scientists from uh, Alberta. Um, MNR weighed in. They uh, were working, working uh, uh, in intensively and uh, strongly from their avenues to get this change. So this was one of those examples where you can do right by endangered species and you can um, build your, tr or get your transmission line if you're willing to look at alternatives. The second example I wanted to mention was forestry. We uh, also work on forestry. We're a member of the Canadian Boreal Forest Agreement. This is a uh, new agreement signed a couple years ago between 22 forest companies and eight environmental groups. It was essentially a burying of the hatchet. We wanted to set aside our war in the woods and work together to um, come up with caribou action plans, protected areas plans, and uh, to also increase the prosperity of the companies. So it wasn't just about environment, it was about environment and economy together. So we have been working on caribou in northern Ontario, in uh, east, northeastern Ontario. And if you look at that far right range in Ontario, the red one, that's called the Kasagami Range. It is a, a, a not self-sustaining range. And this map that you're looking at are ranges of caribou across Canada. This is the new, this is the new state of play for Canada and caribou. They all have ranges, some are well-defined, some not so much. But when you operate in caribou country, one of the first things you need to ask yourself is, what range am I in and how uh, imperiled is it? Is it a green range, is it a red range, and what can I do, and what does my project, how does my project contribute to uh, the disturbance of that range? Is my project gonna make it worse, or is my project gonna be neutral, or is there a way for my project to even make it better? So we're, uh, we focused on that right, uh, sorry, that red uh, caribou range, and we came up with a plan for forestry that we believe is more precautionary for caribou and that takes into account the latest science. But again, because I was able to, uh, and, and there was a team of us, and because we were able to sit across the table from the forest companies and actually listen to their interest, and they were able to listen to our interest around caribou, we were able to come up with an innovative plan then not only, in our estimation, does a better job of protecting caribou habitat, but it also increased wood supply for the companies. That doesn't usually happen, and in this case it did. And because it did, it also enabled us to have an entry point to speak to the local mayors and also to the First Nations. And so not only did we devise a plan that increased wood supply, that protected caribou habitat, but it, um, was able to be uh, modified by the local mayors. They supported it. And also, we were able to modify our plan in response to First Nations. So it was a, in my estimation, another example of how there are successes out there that can be done for endangered species. It doesn't have to mean the sky is going to fall. And um, you can, uh, with a little bit of work, or a lot of work, 
uh, you, can, you can do some stuff for endangered species. This just kind of zooms in to show you exactly what our plan is. Um, we, we, did, we departed from what was being done and we came up with a three-zoned approach. Doesn't necessarily mean it has to be done everywhere, but um, there are some merits to it being done in this part of Ontario. And we're um, hoping to be very close to getting an announcement in terms of uh, actually getting it implemented. So we're hoping that in terms of uh, it can be a, a precedent in terms of collaboration and in terms of uh, how to work together. And in terms of the Endangered Species Act, we, the, the Canadian Boreal Forest Agreement signatories also weighed in on how would forestry operate within this new context of the, of the Endangered Species Act. And our suggestion is that we really try and see what a Section 18 might look like using a forest management plan. So they have a forest management plan, it guides their uh, operations. How can we work with that and protect the species and allow them to use this instrument? So that's what we're going to be um, asking for and, and trying to work through in the next little while. And then the last example I just wanted to touch, touch on is the Ring of Fire. And it's a, a mining development in Northern Ontario. Just out of curiosity, how many folks work in Northern Ontario, live in Northern Ontario? A few, okay, that's good. Um, how many people think Northern Ontario is north of Highway 7? <laughs> Should have asked that up front. Um, so, the Ring of Fire, how many have heard of the Ring of Fire? All righty. So it's, a, you know, there, if you believe the hype, there's great potential for transformational mining. It's going to be uh, wonderful. There's going to be jobs for thousands of people, um, many, many mines. And um, so the challenge we face from an endangered species standpoint is this is mining in a pristine landscape. We have, uh, not only is it a pristine uh, landscape, it's a pristine waterscape. And there's not really much we can do that's going to be good for the endangered species up here. We're dealing with a situation where you've got, you think of this as your 100% bar for endangered species. Whatever they do in terms of mining, it's going down. We're not going to leave, there, we can't leave it better for them here. Um, but what does, what does innovation mean in the Ring of Fire with endangered species? Well, because caribou are wide-ranging, wolverine are wide-ranging, um, and we've got really important watersheds, what we can do is um, innovation here means a regional look. So right now we have these piecemeal project-level environmental assessments. One company, another company, they look at their little, you know, their little circles, and no one's taking a look at the big picture or the, or the region. It's called a regional environmental assessment. That's what we need. And so if you want to be innovative in the Ring of Fire and you want to take care of endangered species, you need a regional environmental assessment. And so that's my food for thought on Ring of Fire. And thanks again for asking me to come out today.